Or are these beings actually the same thing? The biggest question, the most important question that every human can ask is where do we go when we die? Because we will all die one day. I personally believe that all the answers are found in Scripture, in the Bible. Now you might be saying, Daniel, all right, wait, if the God of the Bible is real, if He exists, then how do you explain all these other gods, all these other religions? And what about aliens? Do you believe aliens exist? Are we the only intelligent life there is? Or are there more on other planets? Well, someone once said that, I don't believe that there's intelligent life on other planets because there's not even intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> but all right, let's get to the point. The real question that you should ask yourself is this. Even if these other beings are real and have power, are they gods, aliens, demons? Or are these beings actually the same thing? Maybe people just look at similar evidence and they interpret it according to their beliefs. Because a man sees as he is. Scientists do the same thing today. They look at the same evidence, but they interpret it differently. According to Wikipedia, there is an estimated of 10,000 distinct religions worldwide. Worldpopulationreview.com says there are only around 4,000. Now, some of you might be asking me, all right, Daniel, so if Christianity is right, if the Bible is true, then where do all these other thousands of religions come from? Where are these gods coming from then? Well, take it easy, because this is what I'm going to explain to you in this video. And to most of you, it is going to be shocking. First of all, you need to know that you don't need to study all these thousands of religions to know if it's true or not. Because when you look at all of them, it can be brought down to only three basic groups. One, only the universe exists. So here you find atheism and so on. Two, only God or gods exist. Here you find Buddhism and so forth. And lastly, both the world and God exist. Here you find, for example, Christianity, Islam and Judaism. So you don't need to be an expert in all these thousands of religions to critique them. You just need to critique the one group that they fall under and then you critique all the religions under them. Now, some people claim that Christianity stole their beliefs from other religions. And these people say this with no evidence to back it up and they don't know what they're talking about because it is not true. Some of the evidence that they try to show comes from the Roman Catholic Church's beliefs that came later on. It is actually the other way around. Other religions, paganism, stole their ideas from Christianity. Jesus Christ didn't just exist 2,000 years ago. That was when He came to earth in human form. He was always there in the beginning, before humankind. You can watch my video on that a little bit later on the DLM Christian Lifestyle channel. Now, we can talk about this for hours. So let's go back to where this all started, where all other religions first began. There are many ancient writings about this, but let us start with the Bible first. Genesis 6 verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him to His heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals, and creeping things, and birds of the heavens. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now you might say, what? I didn't see anything about starting other religions here. Well, just wait a little bit. Let's go back to verse 4. 
Now the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the Hebrew word here for giants is Nephilim. So this group of fallen angels, demons or, or watchers called by other ancient writings, married human females and they had half-breed children with them. Many of these mixed breeds grew very big. They were immensely powerful and were called the Nephilim. In English, the mighty men of old. We know that these giants, these uh, mighty men of old or Nephilim, were real. Not just because we read it in the Bible, but because it's mentioned in many other ancient writings as well, in other cultures. And some ancient writings say that these half-breeds came from the line of Cain. You know Cain, the first human being that was born on earth from Adam and Eve? He sinned against God, he killed his brother Abel, and then this happened. Genesis 4 verse 16, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mahuyal. Then the list goes on to explain the line of Cain. Many other ancient writings say that this, in the east, this is the area where the fallen angels came down, they married the woman of earth, the line of Cain, and they had these half-breeds, half-human, half-demons. Now, the Bible doesn't say it, but it could have been true. What we do know is that these Nephilim did exist, that they were on the earth. Most writings also explain how humans worshipped these fallen angels and Nephilim because they believed that they were gods. So the Nephilim ruled over humans on earth as kings. Now, they also taught humans certain crafts. Now, just make a mental note here, because if you, are, if you know anything about Illuminati, it is said that if you are in the Illuminati, you are in the craft. I'll talk about this a little bit later on. So these fallen angels taught humans these certain mysterious crafts, knowledge. For example, some ancient literature like the Book of Enoch says this in a summary. Fallen angels, also called watchers, began to have sexual intercourse with women and gave birth to giants hundreds of feet tall, and the giants began to devour animals and men, even drinking their blood. The fallen angels taught them crafts. Azazel taught humans how to make weapons and showed women how to use their beauty for seduction. Armoros taught enchantments. Baraquijal taught humans astrology like horoscopes. Kokabel constellations. Ezekiel, interpretation of clouds. Arachiel, interpretation of earth and some gel lunar months. Now, you might not realize this, but you've probably already heard about the Nephilim before. Over generations, the names just changed and it's packaged differently. But the Nephilim, you've heard of that before. Other cultures might call them demigods. Those are the children of God, supposed gods and humans which is exactly what the Bible says. The sons of God came down and they married the woman of earth and they brought forth the Nephilim. There is nothing new under the sun. The Greek legends call them Titans, which you probably saw in a few movies already. For example, Poseidon, the god of the sea, married a human female, just like we see in the book of Genesis. Plato, for example, wrote about this. He said Poseidon and his wife had children, five sets of twins, and these children were titans who became the kings of the Atlantean Empire. Now, Plato did not write about this as a myth or just a story. He was serious. That's why people are still searching for the lost city of Atlantis to this day. And we have these stories of these mixed breeds, these giants from all cultures over all the world. Like the Anunnaki that we read about in the Sumerian history from around 4,500 years ago. These Anunnaki also became the kings or rulers over the Sumerians. We see this in the history of the Greeks as well. For example, Heracles, aka Hercules, son of Zeus and the mortal woman Alcmene. Perseus, son of Zeus and the human woman Danae. And you find more than 30 other demigods here in Greek history as well. In Norse history, for example, Shamigur and other demigods. Shamigur was the son of Odin and the mortal human woman, Queen Skade. The list just goes on and you'll find stories of these Nephilim, these demigods, 
in Hindu mythology, Mayan, Native American, Irish, Polynesian, Roman, African, Sumerian, and others. It all started in the pre-flood period, also called by a lot of people today as the antediluvian period. These people worshipped these fallen angels and their uh, half-breeds as gods because they were so powerful and because they were so big. Some might have been smaller but still look a little bit different because they were mixed breeds. So people today, modern people, when they look at them, they would probably think they're aliens because they all look so very different and strange. So do aliens exist? Well, you're half right because there are other beings that are not human. In those times, they were real. Fallen angels and also these mixed breeds. Today, there are also demons. So aliens are not beings from other planets, but from other dimensions. And there's a whole spiritual world that we know exists. Millions of people talk about it, me included. And these beings can reveal themselves to people. You call them maybe aliens, but we know in fact that they are demons. The idea of aliens is demon-made to deceive people from finding the real truth. Demons can easily shapeshift and appear to humans in a physical form if they want to. When we look in the Bible, we also see that angels appear to humans in a physical form when they needed to. More on this later. Now, some ancient writings also indicate that strange beings like centaur, siren, cyclopses, and other half-man, half-beasts were some of these Nephilim. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, so I'm not fully convinced, but these stories could have come from this time period of these Nephilim, where the Nephilim walked the earth and people saw them. You need to understand that in the pre-flood period, in the antediluvian period, there were advanced civilizations, human beings living together with these fallen angels that came down to marry the, the woman and have these mixed breeds. So imagine this world. And they were part of the reason why the world became so evil. Because remember, right after the Bible talks about them, it says this in verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, if you believe in aliens, you would probably believe that these beings are aliens. If you would teleport, for example, just quickly in that time and you would see these Nephilim and these fallen angels, then you would probably just think, man, they are aliens because that's what you believe, right? This is probably what aliens would believe, would look like. Because you don't know what true angels and demons look like because you never had that experience. And when we look at certain angels in the Bible, when the Bible describes them, they also look pretty weird. It's not just these cheesy aliens that we sometimes see on TV. Ezekiel describes four angels that he saw. Ezekiel 1 says they had human likeness, but four wings. Each one had four faces. The legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the soles of a calf's foot. They sparkled like burnished bronze and under the wings they had hands like humans. Now you've probably heard about the angel Gabriel. Daniel saw him and he describes him in Daniel 10. I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Ufaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Not all the angels look the same. Not all the demons look the same. So you can just imagine. Some ancient writings say that this certain group of fallen angels who came down and married the, the women of the earth, they had viper snake-like uh, faces. So you can just imagine how these mixed breeds that they created looked like. The Bible does not tell us, but the old Gnostic writings describe them as having long protruded chins, high cheekbones, elongated skulls, and slanted eyes. Now, this sounds like what you know as, this is probably an alien. Well, no, it's Nephilim. And we see this in the art that they drew, even thousands of years later. Even in Egypt, we see some of this. Take a look at this Egyptian art from Queen Nefertiti. 
and Pharaoh Akhenaten. They still have these snake-like faces, even thousands of years after the original Nephilim were created. From different cultures, we also see these different serpent, um, lizard-looking gods with wings. Quetzalcoatl is the serpent god of the Aztecs, sometimes also drawn as a dragon, which you can get when you put a serpent together with wings. Wajet is the Egyptian cobra goddess. Renanutet is another Egyptian goddess, at times with the head of a lion, but is also known in the underworld to take the shape of a huge serpent that breathes fire. Nehebukau is the son of the goddess Renanutet, and he is a giant snake guarding the entrance of the underworld. The theme of these ancient serpent gods that were eternal is everywhere. If you just look, their symbol is everywhere. In ancient Greece, we have, for example, the Gorgons, three female serpent gods known as Steno, Uriel and Medusa. In Hinduism, there are the Nagas, half serpent gods that can take the form of snakes or humans. You also get Garuda, the eagle type god. In Australia, we have the rainbow creation serpent god. In Norse history, we have Jormungandr, the big snake coiled around the earth with the demon Wolf Fenrir as his brother. And Hel, the goddess of death, as his sister. It is his venom that supposedly kills Thor. In Celtic worship, we have the snake goddess Kora. And now just after the flood, in the time of the Sumerians, we find Ningizida. His symbol is the twisting serpent figure the god of agriculture and the underworld. Meshushu is another example. This is the serpent god on the Ishtar gate of Babylon. The Anunnaki, they are also known as eagles or ravens. Look, I can go on and on because it does go on and on. But if you look at all these re religions and how they started, they have the same theme. Gods came down, had sexual intercourse with women of earth and they created demigods. You see that in all the cultures. Like even the Nagas of Hinduism that created demigods with human females. These are the fallen angels that came down and slept with the women of earth and created the Nephilim. That's where it started. In, imagine just this world in the antediluvian period where you have all these fallen angels and you have these uh, giants, half-breed, mixed breeds and people worship them as gods. Imagine how evil the world was because it was evil. Imagine the rape, murder, human sacrifices and rituals that were going on and on. And God said, it's enough. He washed it all away with the flood. Now these Nephilim were still on the earth after the flood. The blood was highly diluted. They weren't as big and as strong as they used to be before the flood. But we know that other ancient writings wrote that they existed after the flood and also the Bible. Genesis 6 verse 4 says, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, meaning before the flood, and also afterward. Now, we don't know exactly how they still continue to live after the flood because the flood killed everyone. There's a few ancient writings that say different things, but the Bible doesn't really tell us. It could have been that the line of the Nephilim came through one of uh, Noah's sons, the, one of the women that they married, Probably the line of Cush and through Nimrod, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later on. It could also have been that some of those, those groups of uh, fallen angels still slept with some of the women and God stopped it. Because Jude 1 verse 6 says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal change under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So this is why we don't have Nephilim today anymore, because this certain group of fallen angels, they are now chained in utter darkness. They're there right now while you're watching this video. The fact is that we see evidence of the Nephilim in the time period after the flood as well. There's a lot of evidence for this. We see this when Israel escaped Egypt and entered into the promised land. For example, Numbers 13 verse 32. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out, it is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. 
Here are a few more examples. King Og during the time of the Exodus. Deuteronomy 3 verse 11. For only Og, the king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. Behold, his bed was a bed of iron. Is it not in Rabbah of the Ammonites? Nine cubits was its length, and four cubits its breadth, according to the common cubit. The Rephaim here is the descendants of the Nephilim. Some ancient writings, some people say that it's part of the, the kingly uh, Nephilim. But it was a bed of iron here because a normal bed could not have contained this massive body. The bed was between 13 and 16 feet tall. That's over four meters long. So Og was a giant. Many years later, we read about David who fought Goliath. That's famous. You know, it's even in normal stories these days. But Goliath was a lot smaller than Og. And Goliath was not the only giant. He had brothers and there were others as well. 1 Chronicles 20 verse 5. And there was again war with the Philistines. And Elhanan, the son of Jair, struck down Lachmi, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. That's huge. And 2 Samuel 21 verse 16 says, And Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze, and who was armed with a new sword, thought to kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruai, came to his aid and attacked the Philistine and killed him. Verse 18, After this there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai, the Hishatite, struck down Sup, who was one of the descendants of the giants. And there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. And Elhanan, the son of Jari Oregon, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft that whose spear was like a weaver's beam. This was a different Goliath. Verse 20, And there was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature, who had six fingers on each hand, and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in number, and he also was descendant from the giants. And when he had taunted Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. These four were descendant from the giants in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Six fingers and six toes. Interesting, right? Because they were half-breeds. But remember, this was many years after the flood, after the antediluvian period. And so the DNA was highly diluted. So they weren't as big as the original Nephilim in the antediluvian period. Some ancient writing says that they were between 20 and uh, 60 feet, and some say even more than 100 feet. Now, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but they were big. They were huge. And after the flood, there were still many of them left, whole tribes and clans of them. We read in Deuteronomy 2 verse 20, It is also counted as a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there. But the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people great and many, and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. Joshua 11 and verse 21, And Joshua came at the time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from Deber, from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel, Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. So they had many cities. There were many of them. Deuteronomy 2 verse 11. Like the Anakim, they are also counted as Rephaim, but the Moabites called them Emim. The evidence of the Nephilim has always been there. Take some time and look at the evidence of non-biblical writers like Jewish historians like Josephus and Philo. Then the second temple literature, the book of giants, the book of Enoch, and so forth. So, let me quickly summarize here. So, we know that fallen angels came down, they slept with the women of earth, and they created the Nephilim, right? We see this from all cultures, different cultures that say that these supposed gods came down, slept with the women of earth, and they created demigods, Nephilim. So, all of it proved that the Bible is true. And this world became extremely evil. So, God washed it all away with a flood. And yes, for some of you who don't believe that there was a flood, I'm going to show you the evidence of a flood in the next video. We're going to talk about that and it's going to be very interesting. Now, only Noah, his three sons, and their wives survived the flood. That's what the Bible says. 
The Bible says in Genesis 9 verse 18, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. So Noah was a righteous man. He believed in God, his family as well. So they brought all of this knowledge from the pre-flood world with them. Remember this, this is important. They had all the knowledge of how to build certain things, where the old cities were, the locations of them. And now, where do all the other religions come in again? We see this from the one son of Noah, Ham. From the line of Ham, we see that people start to disobey God again, just like the pre-flood world. And they started to do paganism, pagan worship. Now, let me just say this again. Christianity is true. The Bible is true because it's the truth of life itself. Paganism only started later. So, Shem's children will bring forth the nation of Israel and Jesus the Messiah. Japheth's children became the coastland cultures, each with their own language, clan, and nation. And then Ham's children will bring forth disobedience to God again, just like before the flood. His sons are called Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. So Ham's firstborn is Cush. Cush rebelled against God. God wanted him to worship him because God wants all humans to worship and love him. But Cush rebelled. He didn't want to. He went off to do his own thing according to his own fleshly desires, sinful desires. He created his own clan and he wanted to rule people. And that's what he did. And now, Cush is the father of Nimrod. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. Chapter 10, verse 8. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be a mighty man. Verse 9, He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and risen between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Now just remember here again, so Nimrod was the first mighty man again after the flood. Remember Genesis 4 talks about the mighty men of old. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also after it. When the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So biblical texts and other ancient writings show us that Nimrod was a huge guy. I mean, he was big. And with the size and the superhuman strength, people would have easily followed him as their leader. And that's why he created all these cities. So some of the DNA of the Nephilim came through the line of Ham, probably through his wife and Cush, and then you get Nimrod. And we also know about his other sons. And that's where you get the, the, the nations from Canaan and uh, Egypt, where in Canaan, you know, when the Israelites went there, there were the giants. The Bible describes them as the Rephaim. So listen up because this is going to be very interesting. Because this is where I believe most of paganism as we know it today and even the Illuminati started. Did you know that the Illuminati calls Nimrod the first grand master? At the top level of the order, the Illuminati worships Satan directly and they still do so today. Nimrod built Babel, and he was the first world government in a sense. And we can assume that the Tower of Babel was also his doing. Ancient writings describe how Nimrod built the tower in rebellion against God. So the, the whole tower is in rebellion against God. Some people do it even today, and you can see the marks of the Illuminati in the world that we live in today as well. Nimrod wanted to do it so that God could not kill them again with the flood, but he missed the crucial lesson of why God flooded the whole earth in the antediluvian period because they did not repent of their sins and so Nimrod did not learn his lesson and those who followed him did not learn their lesson as well according to the historian Josephus Nimrod said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Antiquities of the Jews, Book 1, Chapter 4. 
Now at this time, these people started to worship Nimrod himself as a god and also other supposed gods, fallen angels in Nephilim. According to Josephus, Nimrod convinced the people to not believe that they got their strength and everything from God himself, but that they should find their own happiness and their own strength from themselves. So in this period, you start to get paganism, witchcraft and all these other occultic stuff that started here. And so it was kind of repeating itself, the world. That's why God had to stop the world in the first place because of the Nephilim and everybody there just being wicked. And now the, the same thing started to happen again. But God promised that he will not send a flood again over the world. So what did he do? While they were building the Tower of Babel, he confused them because they had the same language. So he gave them different languages. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. So imagine if He just left them, how evil oh, the world would have been. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So here, when God dispersed them, of course, they would take all their beliefs and things with them and they would start nations. This is where paganism really started. And Nimrod was wrong. No man is stronger than God. Life itself is a gift from him. And he can take it away anytime that he wants. But he gives us grace, a time of grace to find him, to worship him and to love him. To find the truth for ourselves and to live in that truth. Now, what is interesting, and you would think that all these different people who started to go and disperse over all the earth, that they would have stories of Nimrod, right? They do. Nimrod appears in the mythology of a lot of the ancient cultures. In Greek, in Arabic, Hungarian, Armenian, and Syrian legends, there's evidence that the Epic of Gilgamesh and the story of Hercules are both based on Nimrod's life. So let's just move back to when God dispersed them. So these people took their beliefs with them and that's where paganism started. Paganism came from Christianity, actually. It just distorted. And uh, these people just took their beliefs with them. Paganism was created by demons so that people will believe in the demons as gods and not in the real, true and only God. And if you believe in all these demons, you ultimately believe in Satan. So people say you have all these roads that lead up to the mountain and all the religions are basically the same. No, it is fundamentally different. There's only one way, one truth that leads to Jesus Christ. All the other roads lead to different demons and ultimately Satan. And that's what he wants because he wants to be as God. That's why he is a fallen angel that rebelled against God in the first place. He looked at his, himself and his beauty and he thought, oh, I'm mighty, so you know what? I want to be God. Now, let me share something that's also very interesting. Keep in mind, this is not from the Bible. So I'm not 100% sure if this is correct, but it could be. This is from many other ancient writings and people today believe in other ancient writings easily more than they believe in the Bible. Even though the Bible is the best source of ancient writings that we have. Um, if we look at all the copies of ancient literature, the Bible is number one. We can put the Bible together in its original form from over 60,000 copies. Many ancient writings say that Nimrod used the seven sacred sciences to gain power. The same crafts given to men by the fallen angels before the flood. Men like Enoch. So, after the period of the flood, Nimrod again finds this knowledge and he uses it again and the world becomes more evil. So, history repeats itself. Remember, I told you at the beginning of this video that the fallen angels gave certain crafts the knowledge of certain things to humans. Not for good, but to do sin. And now Nimrod has this knowledge and he is doing the exact same thing. I don't have time to talk about everything, but let me give you a few bullet points. 
Hermes shared the pre-flood knowledge with Nimrod. Some say Hermes is a Nephilim, others a fallen angel, and others say that he is a name combined of the three different individuals before and after the flood who all carried the knowledge of demon crafts, a type of spirit of Hermes that goes on through different generations. Nimrod uses the knowledge to build Babel and the big tower to honor the gods, aka demons, as they did in the antediluvian time. The tower symbolizes rebellion against God. Hermes uses the crafts to create the priesthood of polytheism, meaning worshiping demons as gods, that was set up in the pre-flood period. This is a Nephilim wizard or magic type of religion where they talk to or report to these gods, aka demons. So now, after Nimrod died, a lot of people say that his wife Semiramis, I think that's how you pronounce it, she took over. Now there are different stories about her, but there's one that, that's very interesting to me. And you find it in different sources. Uh, a good book that explains it is the book of 1853 called The Two Babylons. And it basically says this, Shem and his followers wanted to stop Nimrod and his evil deeds and killed him. Now for his wife Semiramis, she claimed the virgin birth that the demons knew would happen with Jesus. So you see, she basically claimed this virgin birth that the demons at that time knew would happen with Jesus. Do you see how sly these demons are? Shem, the other son of Noah, and his followers wanted to stop Nimrod and his evil deeds and kill him. Remember Shem, he's the great, 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 great grandfather of the nation of Israel, those who follow God. So you have Nimrod, they worshipped as a father god. You have Semiramis that they worshipped as the mother god. And now you have the sun god that they also started to worship. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Polytheism and many pagan religions have this same theme, the exact same theme. That's where they start. A mother god, a father god, and a sun god. Semiramis claimed that Nimrod did not really die, but ascended to the sun and became the sun god. And the rays of the sun god caused her to become pregnant. And they have to worship him now as Baal, the sun god. And remember, they also have to worship her because she was the goddess that was divinely created. She said she is the moon goddess who came down from the moon in a moon egg that fell into the Euphrates River. So this queen of Babylon basically became the moon goddess called Ishtar, Istarte or Astoreth, which many people believe is where we get our Easter from. Now, this is probably the same queen of heaven that we read about in Jeremiah 44 verse 16. As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you, but we will do everything that we have vowed, make offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we did both we and our fathers. Hmm. Her son's name was born Tammuz, this new god, born on the winter, the day of the winter solstice. Interesting, isn't it? Now he was believed to be killed by a wild pig, and then he ascended to his father, the sun god, and they became one. So these people who continued to worship them, they stayed there and kept on worshiping them. And we see this first mysterious religion here of worshiping the father god, the mother god, and the sun god. And this weird religion of Babylon started to spread in, into other countries like Egypt, Persia, and Greece. And over time, we see the same story just packaged and just using different names. For example, Babylon followed Nimrod, the sun god, Semiramis, the mother god, and Tammuz, the sun god. Nordics follow Odin, the father god, Joro, the mother god, and Thor, the sun god. Egypt follows Ra, the sun god, Isis, the mother god, and Horus, the sun god. Rome follows the father god Jupiter, the mother god Diana, and the sun god Apollo. Hinduism follows the father god Vishnu, the mother god Chandra, and the reborn sun god Krishna. Greece follows the father god Zeus, and the mother god Artemis, and the sun god Adonis. Now we know that in paganism there can be many other gods as well, but when you look at the core, there is always a mother god, father god, and a son god. And for those of you who are Roman Catholic, you also need to hear this. Roman Catholics also brought this in when they started to worship Mary as the mother god. 
if you pray to or worship Mary, then you need to know that this is paganism. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that we have to pray to Mary. Actually, God forbids it that we pray to dead people. And it clearly says that Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and men. You should not even pray to the saints. That's paganism. Now, the point I'm slowly trying to make in this whole video is this. There's enough evidence that shows us that there are no aliens or other gods, that there's only one God. All the other ones are demons pretending to be gods because they are powerful, because they are real, and because they were Nephilim as well in the old days where we get all these ancient stories from. And even to this day, people worship other demons thinking that they are other gods. And I say this to you with a lot of love. Ask yourself, is this true? The Bible said thousands of years ago in Deuteronomy 32 verse 14, they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently, whom your fathers had never dreaded. All of this started thousands of years ago in the antediluvian period, where fallen angels left their proper domain and slept with the women of earth and created the Nephilim in where they deceived people to believe that they were gods and that their half-breeds were gods as well. And people worshipped them as such, even after the flood as well. And these Nephilim and these fallen angels ruled over these nations, like the Anunnaki in the Sumerian time around 4,500 before Christ, Cheya of the Indio, the Zoras, the Tengu of the Japanese, the Zobalba of the Kishamaya, and it goes on and on. You will find the same stories, just with different names, in different cultures. And how interesting is it? That is the same stories, but these cultures, they were thousands of miles, kilometers away from one another and at different time periods. But it is still the same. I'll say it again. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, demons are powerful. They do have power and they can shapeshift. And they can reveal themselves to you in a physical form, pretending to be some god, and you think that they are. Paul talked about this 2,000 years ago. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 19. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. And this is exactly what happened. Not only did the demons deceive people outside of the truth and just basically full-on rebelled against God, but they started to deceive people who were within the truth to show them another truth. It was always polytheism versus monotheism, many gods versus one God. But now they take monotheism versus monotheism, meaning they're giving people another truth of monotheism. Let me explain. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 says, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. It is easy for demons to pretend to be angels. It is easy for Satan to disguise himself as the angel of light. And you know, this is one thing that when you look at history, that people who worship these other uh, pagan gods, they never realized that the father god they worshiped, whether it is Baal, Ra, Zeus, Jupiter, Odin, Vishnu, or any other form of this father god, his real name is Lucifer, the devil. He was one of the highest ranking angels in heaven, but he wanted to be as God, and so he rebelled. He fought against God's angels and he lost. So God threw him down on earth and he's now still walking around on earth like a lion, roaring, looking who he can devour. He wanted to be like God and he started with Eve. Since then, he deceived human beings to lure them away from the truth. Now, as I said, they got a plan to deceive people within monotheism to give them another monotheism religion, right? 
We see people, when we look at history, who thought that they saw an angel of the Lord. And this angel gave them new revelations and they felt so special. And they write this, they, they wrote this uh, revelations down. But when we look closer, we see that these people acted strangely, foaming of the mouth, being thrown down by the angel. Some even gripped here in the neck forcefully. I mean, that doesn't sound like God's loving angels. It sounds similar, right? Like the video that I just explained to you in the, in the previous part of this whole series of what demon possession looks like. But these people followed these supposed angels, aka demons, to give a new theory of the truth. For example, a supposed angel called Maroni appeared to Joseph Smith a few times in the 1800s and told him that all the other churches are not following the real faith anymore and that Joseph has been chosen to restore the real Christian faith. So this angel gave him new revelations and Joseph Smith started the Mormon faith which is actually called the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. You'll see that their teachings is in contrast with the original Bible. Another example is Islam. A supposed angel called Gabriel appeared to Muhammad in a cave and gave him new revelations over a period of time. People saw him as well on the floor, lying around, foaming in the mouth, and uh, he was actually afraid. They also know about when he was younger about seeing jinns. Jinns in, in that culture, just so you know, is basically another word for demons. But he was actually scared out of his mind. He ran away and then he came back later. Anyway, he was illiterate and people helped him to write down what this supposed angel demon told him. Now demons, as we already discussed in the previous video, can let you experience occultic and strange things. So they can appear as angels, right, deceive you but they can also let you experience occultic things. So where do you think these things of spiritualism or chakras and opening up your third eye come from? Let's take Buddhism, for example. Gautama was a prince. He followed Hinduism and then he stopped believing in Hinduism. He, he thought, man, I can't agree with this. So he walked away. First, he starved himself almost to death. They said that he could touch his uh, tummy here and feel the backbone and he almost died. There were three friends that followed him and uh, when he walked away they were kind of angry at him. But then he found this tree and he thought, man, I'm gonna sit under this tree until I find truth. And so he wanted to open himself up to everything that is out there to tell him truth. So that's what he did. So don't you think that a demon could easily have just come because he opened himself up to all things there to give him a special revelation, nirvana, a special level of enlightenment and still Buddhists can experience it today. Where do you think it comes from? Could it have been a demon and still demons today? Of course it can. Even if the feeling is good and it's nice and you like it, then you have to look deeper than that. Because as long as they keep you away from the truth, they're happy. There's actually a lot more that I can talk about this, but we don't have time. Let's take Hinduism, which doesn't really have a start date because it's a religion that started to exist over many years with different ideas and stories all put together and it changed over time. There's nothing concrete about this. If you look into this, you'll see that there's so many holes and some of you who are watching this video might be a Hindu and I'm telling you this out of love because I care for you. Just ask yourself, do you really believe that it is true? After everything I've said, is it possible that some of these other gods are actually demons pretending to be gods. Of course it is. If you've watched the previous video of demon possession, you know that my dad and I later on helped him to free people of demon possession. And a lot of that came from people who followed other religions. There was one woman who we helped who had a demon Kali in her with the tongue coming out and everything. Now people say that all roads lead to the same God. No. It doesn't. That's what the devil wants you to believe. Jesus Christ, He is the truth, the way, and the life. No one comes to God the Father except through Him. Every other road leads directly to Satan worship and ultimately hell for all eternity, which has been prepared for Satan and his demons and those who worship and do their will. Now, apart from giving you other religions, what other attack do you think the devil can make on the truth, just so you don't find the truth? 
Some of you already had doubts when I talked about certain events in the Bible, like the flood. Some of you think, man, the flood didn't happen because evolution is true, isn't it? That's another lie of Satan and those who push evolution down your throat in school and even in entertainment. They don't want you to know everything, especially what I've told you about the pre-flood world, because they don't want you to know that it was real. So they are brainwashing people to believe in evolution instead of believing the Bible. Because the Bible says that there was a pre-flood world. Civilizations with cities and then there was a flood. But they don't want you to believe that because if you believe that, then you will probably believe that the rest of the Bible is true as well. And this is exactly what we're going to talk about in the next video. I'm going to give you evidence that there was a flood and also evidence that we're finding in these last few decades about pre-flood civilizations is going to be very interesting so if you haven't subscribed yet please do so now so you won't miss that video and before you go always remember life is short so don't waste yours cheers guys